Gather around you beautiful, beautiful rogues because we are about to witness something beautiful. You're going to feel really, really good because there's nothing that makes me happier than seeing one of our own create magic. And that's exactly what Deviant Olive did when he taught how to pick locks to the Texas School for the Blind. It's magical. It's wonderful. You're going to feel good in your heart. It's going to... You know what? That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Deviant. This is really, really great. Um, there you go. Is it illegal? Okay. You want to try is number it two? To try and open a car door. <laughs> if it's if it's your car, no. it's okay. <laughs> if it's their car, I don't have a car. <laughs> okay. I don't have a car. But it's okay. He, you would have to talk with your mom and dad. Yes. Anyway, he's gonna get on car talks. What we're talking about law. So what are we doing here with all these parts? A lot of the origin of this can be traced back to my friend Jeremiah, someone who got in touch with me during the pandemic and said, Hey, you know, Dave. I've seen some of your videos and I've, I've listened to a lot of your stuff. And I think that lock picking thing sounds really fun. I'd like to learn that. It would be a cool hobby and I'm stuck inside, you know. He said, but I don't know quite if I'm the right candidate for this because one, I, I live alone. I don't really have family around anymore. Two, I live really far. I'm in this remote Alaskan fishing village. I mean, we don't even have roads. We come in by plane. Oh, and three, I, I'm blind from birth. And I said, that's fascinating because when you think about locks and you're sticking little tools inside of locks well you're not looking inside the lock the tool is what's in the lock you're doing it all by touch and feel except learning about it and the way i've been teaching about it for decades now it's always involved big diagrams and animations and a lot of visual instruction so i was like this is a fascinating question a first of all yes you're the ideal candidate i told jeremiah because you want to learn something and a desire to learn should be the only qualification for getting to learn something. I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chew on this. Let me get back to you. And I worked with some of my 3D modeling team and a really wonderful guy at 3D Locksport, my friend Tony. And I said, hey, you have these parts. Can you make them a little bit differently? And can you change this one? And, and I got a bunch of pieces and I said, I could probably do something with this. And I reached out to Jeremiah. I said, hey, still, still interested in that lock picking thing? He said, oh yeah, I wanna try it, man. I said, okay, well you can get mail, right? He's like, we kind of get mail up here. Like it takes a while. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna put a box in the mail. You tell me when you get it. I sent him this box. And then we got on a Zoom. He got his camera on his webcam to like tilt down at a table. And over this slow rural internet, we kind of walked through a series of exercises that you're all gonna do together today. And we built the idea of a lock just by feel and by assembling these big parts. And if you can understand how the parts work, and the way they're supposed to be used, you'll also in the process learn that you can use them kind of different ways. And by the end of today, not only will you be manipulating and opening big oversized plastic locks, we will also spread out real metal, real world locks and tools, and you're going to scale down what you did and do it on the real world tiny scale of slipping picks into locks and getting them open. Let's get you set up. And by the end of 90 minutes, I mean, he was picking real locks and I was just flipping. And he had a great time and he reached out to some friends and he said, hey, this is a new thing to learn, want to try it. And I've been in touch ever since with other members uh, of the unsighted community and the blind community. I went down to Oregon, I was at DEF CON and Texas invited me down here. So we're going to see if at scale, this can be a viable lesson plan in a classroom setting. I'm hoping it is, I'm really hoping for the feedback and the best thing out of the today will be learning from the students here what works and what doesn't. Because I'm, I'm the one who's really, as much as I'm teaching, I'm always learning and I wanna learn how to make this better. And I want this to be as accessible as I can to anyone who wants to make similar plans and spread them to your classrooms too. I really hope that people get a lot out of this and it's viable as a way to learn. I am Deev or Deviant uh, for the long form. I have been doing locks and lock picking for a while. And I heard some students asking and talking, so yeah, I use he or they, it's fine. But my work stuff is weird. That's the weirdest thing about me. My job, in addition to being a locksmith and a safe technician, I run a team of people that we get hired to break into places to see how secure that place is. And I'm so thrilled to have people here who wanna see, like, we all use locks, we all use keys every day, but if we don't question how they work, they might not be quite doing what you think. So what we're going to do is explore locks and lock picking, lock manipulation, the art of opening a lock without a key. This is something we're doing in a learning environment. You're doing it with permission. Um, your trusted grown-ups can tell you like when it's okay to do this and not. 
In general, if it's not your lock or a lock that someone gave you permission to touch and use, you probably shouldn't try to use it without the key. Right. Yes, question. I remember as a kid, the way I unlocked the door that in my house, I grabbed a pair of scissors and stuck it through the thing and I twisted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used a coat hanger. A coat hanger, scissors, yeah. So spoons. There's a lot of ways that our doors and our systems don't work the way we're expecting. And keeping, keeping that in your mind and thinking about it, they become like little puzzles. And I like the idea of mechanical analog puzzles. They, they're, they're games to a lot of us. They don't require batteries or plugging in. You can play with locks and try to manipulate them and let them tell you what's going on deep inside of them without looking inside. So most locks, aren't they like the same or could you, do you use different techniques for different locks? Incredibly cool question. Are most locks the same and do the same techniques apply? Or do you need like a special tool or a special technique each time? Most locks that we use, if you have a key that I'll describe a key as a sort of a part you hold in your hand that might be round or flat. And then usually there's a long blade extending out from that key with little teeth on it. And the blade is relatively flat. That style of key is pretty universal. And most of the locks, I would say well over two thirds of the locks that you use with a key like that are going to be what are called pin tumbler locks. There's little pins inside the lock. And they all tend to do the same thing, regardless of the brand or whether it's a padlock or a door lock. So the techniques you'll learn today are pretty universally applicable. Everything's, there's edge cases, but yes, you can do what you're going to do on most locks. Another question, yes. What do you do if it's a combination lock? Ooh, so combination locks, I didn't bring any. Maybe I'll have to come back. But there are decoding techniques. So you can decode a combination lock. Most of the time, as you'll learn, not just with lock picking, but any kind of hacking, is you sort of stress the system a little bit and make it behave in a way that it wasn't expecting. And sometimes that'll give you information. Normally you enter the combination, then what? You pull the, the lock open or you push a button. Many locks, if you push the button first or pull the lock first and then start trying to move the combination numbers, it'll leak information out at you. No way. Yeah, but I don't have one of the, oh yeah. Like Sue, I could give you like the most popular Master Lock 875 on the store shelf today. Completely without even looking at the numbers, you can pull on the lock and roll the wheels and you can, you can find the combination. Oh. Yes, I would love to show you that. <laughs> I love how many people came from all different places. We have different institutions today. We have friends and visitors. And I mean, I like talking about this stuff, but I'd much rather, I think you'd rather be doing things with stuff in your hands than just listening to me up here. So can I have a couple of the helpful adults help me hand out some baggies to every student? And we're going to get baggies of parts in front of you. Inside of your big bag, you can open it. You may count your bags. They have pieces in them, some big, some small, some thin, some tall, but you should have nine individual bags. Those of you who are sighted may notice that there are little numbered labels on your bags. Those of you who are unsighted may have, let me check your bag let's see. Oh, nice work, Nate. There are, there are also uh, braille numbers on there. Once you make sure you have all nine, you could range them in order just so, you know, you got your space and your neighbor's got their space. What do you use? Do you just like, is there like a... I spit out a label through my label printer, then I fed it through my hand crimper. Yeah, it, I'm glad it worked. It was a janky process, but there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Deve way, which is the wrong way faster. <laughs> can everyone find bag number one? And you can take out the part from bag number one. Ideally, just by gracefully opening the bag, not ripping it open, but you know. I didn't see anybody ripping, but I... There's got to be at least one person like me in this room, so i got to get ahead of that. And now we want to hear from you all. Tell me about part number one. Tell me what, sh what it's shaped like. Key or a lock? Like kind of a key. Okay, so when you say key, is it, is it uniform shaped, or is there one size that's bigger, one part that's smaller? It looks like a doorknob. So there's like a large round part, and attached to it there is a smaller, thinner part, perhaps. A circle and a stem. Oh, a circle and a stem. Yeah, oh, a question back there, yes. These are all 3D printed, yes. I would say the shape you're holding is kind of pear-shaped. Is that okay if I use that as a reference? Yes. Except unlike a pear, there's a big part missing, right? Yeah. There's like a big hollow void in the middle. Yes. Somebody be straight through your pear. Yeah, exactly. So if that pear shape is printed, it's printed laying down on the flat side. The uh, shape was subtracted from it. Yeah. yeah. So when you print things, the very bottom surface is usually extra smooth. And you might feel that of the two flat sides of the pair, one side is super smooth and the other side has a little bit more texture to it. Yes. Yeah. 
The bottom side is the super, super flat side. That would be facing down on the print bed. Now, there's not just a difference in texture, though. Those big flat sides, especially on like the top of the pair where it gets narrower, there's a big difference on one side to the other. There's like a big feature or element. Can you describe a difference? Pete, you're touching what I think you're gonna say. Talk to me about what you're feeling there. I mean, it's more rougher and defined. It's more rough and defined. Now you're running your fingers through something there. How would you describe where your fingers are in front of So this side right here is narrow. Yeah. And this is wide. Well, the first thing you said, the side here. Tell me about the yeah. side here. The side that was not on the print bed. Okay. The side that was not on the print bed. That was facing up. Is there, is it fully, fully flat and solid? Or is there like a gap. large, what There's would you call it? There's a gap or a channel. Yeah. yeah. So in addition to the large round hollow that extends through the whole pair, the top of the pair, the skinny part of the pair also has like a trench or a, or a channel running through it. And a lot of you have found that with your hands. Can you open bag number two, please? And when you get the part out of bag number two, I would love to hear people telling us what it's like. A circle. A circle, okay. You have to smooth down a cylinder. Right, so technically it does have some depth. So this is a very, we might call it a very squat flat the cylinder. Here. Yes, Pete already figured that out. And many of you I'm seeing around the room are already figuring this out. Not only does this have a clearly defined like rough side and thin side, but it is the same diameter as the hollow void on the inside of our pair. And many of you are already figuring out, you can sort of install this circle or this cylinder. When we use a lock and you put a key in a lock and you turn, the part that turns is called the plug. And the plug is that round cylinder that you just took out. And I'm assuming there's two of them or just one? In, a mo in most locks, there's one plug. So the pair, the first part, part number one, that's like the housing of the lock or the shell. And you installed the plug right now. And most of you I'm seeing with your fingertips, you can kind of get it to spin. Yeah, you can kind of get it to turn. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get it to turn. You have to get a good grip on it. I'm in a very easy time. Which is why we're gonna keep moving. If you check bag number three, you may find something different. I would like to know the part in bag number three, how is it different than the, the round cylinder from bag number two? It goes here. This one got some two little thingies. Two little thingies, yes. Talk to me about the little thingies. Some people call them ears. Some people call them nubs. Nubs. Yeah. Any other good words for the two little thingies? Teeth. What? Teeth. Little teeth. Completely take out the round cylinder that had no features on it. Put this one in here. And exactly. You're going to put this one in its place. Yeah, so some people say it's like a fidget spinner, but better. So those little ears, those little nubs, they help you to make that turning. Is there anything else going on on part number three? You got the two little ears, the two little nubs. Which side is, is the really smooth side? The side, the side facing out. The side with, with the ears or without the ears? No ears. So when I install it in the housing, I would usually put that side down. So like both of the smooth sides, the plug and the housing are together. You have the housing and the plug fits in the housing and you have a pretty good way to turn that plug if you want to. Those little ears, they only exist for our model to make it easy to use your hands. In the real world, locks don't have little ears sticking out the front of them, little, little bumps. I found a little something. Some people are already reaching for bag four. Please go ahead and do that. So Jonathan pointed out, and I heard other people saying it too, that part number four is still round, right? Does part number four have little ears on it? Yes. yes. Does it have another new feature? It has the it has the stem. Yeah, oh, so people are calling it the stem. I like that. It's kind of like a long, what I was calling the, the trench or the slot or channel. Does the channel extend 100% all the way through with no interruptions? No. no. What, ha why, what's going on? I'm hearing a lot of no, which is correct. Yeah, at the, like, one end of the channel, there's something in the way, right? To go a long way. Yes, so what, if you wanted to, if you had put that in the housing, and you now have those little handles to help you spin it, right? You could, as you have realized, you could line up those channels, the channel that's part of the housing on the pair, and you could also line up the channel in the plug. The channel can extend from the, the top of the housing all the way through the plug down to the very bottom where there's a little bump in the bottom of the channel. In the real world, the lock has a housing that has these channels in it, and the plug also has channels in it 
because the plug is going to accommodate what are the little parts that are inside of some locks? Pins. Pins. Yeah. Bag number five, some people are like, man, there's nothing in this. It's a very tiny small part. Little, tiny little end of a pen looking thing. Yeah, end of a pen looking thing. What are some other ways we could describe it? It's really spiky. Yeah. Spiky? It's the part of the lock that you need to latch onto. Yeah. Yes. Please feel free to take part number five out. If any time anybody drops anything, they do love to roll away. So just let us know. It's a miniature cone. Like a miniature, almost like a miniature cone? Yeah. It's, it's like a, a cylinder with a cone at the end. Yeah, cool. Little miniature fire hydrant. So it is clearly round, but one end of it, a lot of you have pointed out, it's not flat on both ends, right? Which part's the plug in your lock model here? Wait, with two ears and nothing. The part with two ears that spins, the round part with the two ears? Yeah, that's the plug. That plug has a channel running through it. Yes, sir. And if we wanted to lift that plug out of the housing, so you have it just in, in your one hand, yes. If you're going to install that pin in the plug, is there a way that you could drop that pin into the channel? I think that looks great. Sue, you got it in there? All right. Everyone who installed their pin did it point first. I didn't even tell you to do that, but you just decided to. Why did you do it point first? I'm just curious. Does it felt like the right thing to do? or? You know? <laughs> Let me just see hands if you think it goes point first. And if you think it goes not point first, flat side first. All right, there were a lot more votes for point first. Why did so many people who said point first, why do you say that? Push down the pin. Yeah, it helps unlock it. Yeah. And it pushes back up to lock it. Yes, so there's so many cool answers there. Uh, many of you are anticipating that this pin is going to push on some other pins and the pushy side should be flat. And if you drop it in point first, it will nestle down into the bottom of the plug in that channel and rest into that sort of, it kind of, fits nicely against that little protrusion at the bottom of the channel. You got your pin into the plug, right? Did you get the, did you try putting the plug back in the housing? Yes. It was, it went in pretty smooth. Can you spin it around like with your fingers? <laughs> with just the, just part number five, just the pin, it should probably spin. So what you have right now, is we're gonna keep building our model up, right? We have the housing, and that housing contains a plug, and in the channel in that plug, there is now a little pointed pin. The pin, if you're curious, is called the key pin, because that pin would normally be interacting with the blade of your key when you use a lock, but we're not gonna use keys, because keys are boring. So right now, I saw a lot of people spinning the plug, because the, the key pin doesn't get in the way, it doesn't block anything, the key pin's just fine. Please open bag number six if you haven't yet. Yes, a number of you already have. Tell me about those of you who have while your friends are opening it. It is a small cylinder. Yes, it does. For those who have color, uh, yes, there is a blue color to it. The first pin you were holding, we would call the key pin. The second pin, the pin you're now taking out, that is a cylinder. And when you say cylinder, are the ends of that cylinder uniform? Are they different? Yes, they are smooth, they are flat. Yes, this is a cylinder which has completely flat on both sides. This pushes the pin into the... Yes, exactly. It is called the driver pin because it's going to push on the key pin in a minute. Please go ahead and take the plug back out of the housing. So lift the plug out. You already installed the little key pin, right? Can you also drop the driver pin in as well? Slightly. Yeah, slightly is a good answer, right? There's no way to make the driver pin get all the way down in the plug. It sticks out. It's proud of the surface. It will not go all the way in. Describe what you've done. I did the same thing you do with the first one, mm -hmm. except it's going to stop it at a certain point. Yeah. Kind of the other part hangs from the, the other side. Yes. So you were able to install it but it couldn't get all the way in the plug. Thus, many of you have noticed you can't get the plug to go back in the housing right now because, again, that driver pin is stuck. It's out of the way. Well, you, you're smarter than a lot of these people. You're figuring this stuff out too fast for me. <laughs> so right now, if you tried to put that plug in the housing, it wouldn't go. It's the, that driver pin is in the way. The driver pin's whole job is to be in the way, to, to block things from moving and sliding. So I was like, well, oh no, this driver pin's in the way. We, we can't put the plug in right now. We're gonna have to get the driver pin out. 
there's a couple things you could do. You could just, it's sticking out, right? You could just pinch it and take it out with your fingers, but I'm not gonna have you do that. You could turn the whole plug over and just dump the pins out, but then they would roll all over the floor. We don't wanna do that. If you touch that key pin only, could you push it so the driver pin just kind of falls out the top? I heard one go. Yes. You're both saying the same thing. Talk to me. Push, push which pin? You push the key pin, but because the key pin is touching the driver pin, you got the driver pin to push up and out, right? Yeah. That's what, that's what we're going to do whenever we use a lock. The driver pin's whole job is to what? To be in the way, right? And we want to get it out of the way. But we can't reach the driver pin. We can't touch it. We can't grab it. When you use a lock, you stick stuff in the keyway, a key usually, and it pushes the key pin, which then pushes the driver pin. Bag number seven is where all this is going to come together. Oh, I see. Right here? Yeah. And now tell me about part number seven. It's all fully assembled. There's one new element. Spring. There's a spring, exactly. One new spring. spring. Yes, there's a spring. Uh -huh. So in bag number seven, the housing is there, the plug is there, the key pin is there, the driver pin is there, and there's a spring. So if I told you that you could use the little ears to turn the plug, but of course it doesn't want to turn, right? Why can't you? What's in the way? Is it a spring? Oh, it's a driver pin. Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Driver pin is in the way. Uh, stopping it. Yeah, driver pin's job is to get in the way and stop things. But if you want to try to turn the plug and you can push the key pin, which in turn will push the driver pin, I'd like to see if you can get that plug to turn. And then can you get the plug to turn when you do that? No. Oh, there we Let's go. See. You can, lay, you can lay number seven flat on the table if you want to. It might be a little easier. Ah, now you might have pushed too far. What we're going to do, there you go. How did you? We got one here, very nice. If you maintain a little gentle turning pressure, use those little nubs, little gentle turning pressure, and then push the pin. Yeah, you absolutely did. So yes, I want to make sure everyone can hear this, because you're doing it perfect. It's two things at the same time. You're going to try to turn with those little nubs and push the pins. So you're going to try to catch the, the, just at the moment, as the pins are the right height, the plug's going to turn. So the idea is that we're trying to put a little bit of turning force on the plug and then lift the pins so that you get to the right spot. Bang, perfect. Oh, we got another one there, awesome. Did you get yours? Here, if I hold, the, can I hold the housing? I'm gonna hold this housing. Now, if you try to turn the plug with those little nubs, it doesn't, it doesn't wanna go, right? But can you then, do, go ahead and do a little bit of pressure on the plug, and then push the key pin. Oh. Until it gets to the right spot. You'll know it, because there it goes. Oh, cool. That's what we're gonna do inside of a lock when we're manipulating the pins. Tell me about bag number eight. It don't have no housing or the, it don't have the little pair thing. You got it? Yeah, there's something very, very missing. Bag number eight is a little different. Part number eight is very featureless. The outside of part number eight. The legitimate lock. Yeah, it doesn't give you a lot to work with. The bumps are not there. The bumps are gone. The channel is the channel still there, but you can't feel it anymore. Everything's hidden. So if you want to make any turning pressure on that plug, you're gonna have to use some tools. And the tools are in bag nine. Some diligent people will get part number eight with their fingers, but it's a lot easier if you're using tools. Tell me about the two tools that you have. It's got like a long handle maybe? It's got a or? long handle and it kinda looks like a miniature crowbar. Yeah, it does, that's a good point. Yeah. But it's jagged at this end. Yeah. And how about the other tool? L-shaped. I like that. One tool is for making the turning pressure, and the other tool is for lifting the pins. So I would say the tiny part of the letter L, that's what goes into the lock. It'll turn it into a handle, but it doesn't want to turn, right? But can you get in there with the lock pick and push the pin as well? 
you have to push the pin kind of from above your handle. So oh. a little, if you get above the, the top of your handle. So does that give you the ability to put some turning pressure on it now? Yeah, I can't turn it fully, but it's giving me pressure. All right. Well, what I'm going to ask is if you can give it a little bit of turning pressure. Let me see how you're doing it. You're in the right spot. And now you want to turn, but of course the pins are binding. So do you have another tool you could reach in and push on the pins now? Yeah. And if you can move the pins while you're using the turning tool. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll hold the housing. I'll hold the housing for you. So you work with that handle and try to push that pin. Keep trying to push it. Push, 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 push. You might be using too much turning force. So gentle turning pressure. You're in the right spot. You're good. We want to keep moving that pin. Keep pushing that pin away from you toward me. And now, did it turn? Boom! Keep turning. You got it. This is wicked. You just got it. You just manipulated that locker. And now if you turn it back, it'll snap and it'll reset back to where it was. This is wicked. Yeah. That's what we do with real locks. And then I can just turn it back when it's like Yeah. You can just turn it back. Oh, you lost your key pin. This is amazing. This is literally repinning, repinning locks right here. I'm getting first mm -hmm. behind you kept on using the uh, back end of the pick without the I will come and help in a second. <laughs> without the torque wrench. Just the back of the pick. Put Bang! A Look at that. Point. Push a little more on that pin. You might dig under it if you came straight yeah. down with the tool. Like, it's just kind weird because I'm like not used to using my right hand for that. I hear you. So if we kind of went in like this and slid. Keep turning. Turn pressure. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So reset it. Snap it back. So yeah, and then you're just fighting against that spring. There you go. I think there we go. Nice. Good. I think it's good. It looks good to me. That spring's strong. Yes. I really want to get weaker springs. Um, two, that's kind of a tight fit. For the turner tool? Yeah, oh, for to get the pick and the turner tool. I hear you. Did you get it to turn with your tools? Yes. And it looked like we were getting, did we get some turning yep, over here? Yep, you put it twice and we're going to second turn. This demonstrates the concept. So you could do it with your hands in big size, but we're going to try it with metal. And the exact same thing you just did, it's just going to be a little smaller, but it'll work better because the metal is stronger and easier to use. We're going to start putting the 3D printed parts away because we need room on the tables for the next thing coming. Cool. He said, I did it. I'm really strong and I did it. Super awesome. I am coming around with a small piece of metal. That makes life so much easier. And I'm coming up to the front table. Okay. I feel, I feel really bad now because the only time I realized it was when you were dropping the locks and I'm just like, oh, they're lock holes. Yes, so I just came around and I gave everyone something small and metal. Tell me again uh, what you were saying. My parents had got a house and it had one just like this. Mm -hmm. Took it out and I had taken it apart and it looked just like this one except right here there was like a screw. Yeah. So that probably sounds like what's called a Euro style cylinder. So yes, these are, these are fully assembled lock cylinders. That's really cool that you've already seen something like this before and experienced this. Does this maybe have a pear shape to it? No. Yes. Maybe, I heard yes and no. Oh, maybe, yes, yes. Is there like a round fatter part to the housing and a skinny you know, top, kind of like the pear you were handling? Yeah. Yes. And there is in fact a plug installed in this housing, the plug has a, a little hole right in the front of it. This is a real lock and the round portion of it, one side clearly has a little groove, like a, a very narrow, like little crack in it. And the other side has a sort of a round ring, a ring that has some texture on it. Yeah. The round ring is the rear side of the lock. The groove is the side you want facing you. In front of you on this, there's a board in the middle of the table. And the board has small pieces of plastic that are designed to house these locks. Like that. It's meant to be pretty snug. Oh. Lined up, pretty good. Perfect, okay. perfect, perfect. A good bit of oomph to get it in there once it lines up straight. I feel really bad for saying this to you, but it's like, I don't know how to put the pick in anymore because I'm used to it doing, I'm used to this. I'm used to just- Just by your hands? Yeah. Can we have those uh, cups, one per table, please? Each person is now about to get a tool. Do you have tools here if you need them? Okay. We have an assortment of tools. So now we have an L-shaped tool and a pick with a handle on it. Is this, a, is this the same tool that maybe a thief would use? Similar, yes. Same, same. 
Yeah. Of course, but we're not thieves here, so. Correct. But we're learning about how things work. Just like a, a knife could be used by a criminal or a chef. Lock picks could be used by a thief or a locksmith. Or both. Or both, <laughs> yeah. Can you do the same thing you did with part number eight? Can yeah. you find a place? I already see the L-shaped tools are going in where they belong. This is awesome. So start by trying to get the turning tool in first. So the turning tool goes down at the bottom. I would put it down kind of here. Okay. Now that can, did you just get it? Open. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, how, open. How did I know how to do that? <laughs> because you understand. You understand how it works. Um, work is um, how it works, essentially? Yeah, how it, works. how it functions? How would you say? Yeah, how it locks. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna have to convince my grandparents to get me a set of lock picking stuff in a lock. We got an open? Very nice. That is awesome. What was your name again? Cameron. Nice job, Cameron. Right on. You can have lock number two. He has two pins. How are we doing down here? He's getting it. Wait, have oh. We were just exploring the pins in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did anybody get it at this table? Yeah, I got it. Hey, Dave, do we have a two? We do have a two. I can bring a two this right. This one needs a two. You need a two. Is right in front of you on the table there. In fact, I'm putting other twos on the wood, and you can find them on the board. And for those of you, if you're unsighted, you can feel around the front face of the lock. There's little tick marks. So lock number one has one little tick mark. Lock number two will have two, and so forth. So we've been going for like an hour here. I did mine. Do you really, so you did a number one? Yeah. Do you want a number two? Uh, yes. I will bring a number two, let me see, is this a number two? I can't. I'm left handed. You're left handed? So you might want to put the pick in your left hand. Okay, that makes sense. It might, I mean, that's how I do it, because I'm left handed as well. Yeah. Y'all special people. So if you have your right hand on here, because your right hand doesn't need to do much, Yeah. you should be able to stab that in under the pins now. If you're kind of lined up about here. Push hard to get it in there and under the pins. So now you're under the pin. So if you give a little bit of turning pressure and try to wiggle around to get that pin moving, you might have to rock the tool a little bit. This is like the raking method. A little bit. You're going to try to find that pin that you were under and try to rock it up. Pull the tool out a little bit more. Now rock around there. Are you hitting the pins yet, maybe? You don't want super pressure on that turning tool, just gentle pressure. Lift the pin a little higher than you might have expected. Okay. So you might want to move the whole pick kind of up while, you are, while you're applying that turning pressure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I heard something, maybe. So keep lifting up, 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 up while you are turning. You got it. Okay. You got it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. how, would open, how would you open? How would you open so a door front, with this? Could you do that in a car right too? So you want to put the tool or would it become way. stuck? Like when but you close the door, is it different? Yeah. Um, is the key <laughs> like if the <laughs> key is in there? Could this like get stuck in there? Okay, so um, car doors are a little bit the same, a little bit different. Um, there you go. Is it illegal? Okay. Do you want to try is number it two? To try and open a car door. A little bit of training force. Um, <laughs> if it's if it's your car, it's okay. <laughs> if it's their car, I don't have a car. Okay. I don't have a car. <laughs> your car. Your car. But it's okay. You, you would have to talk with your mom and dad. Yes. Okay. You can't just do it yourself. It could damage and break the car lock. It could. Exactly. You need some disclaimers. Yeah. But so like someone could just come and steal it? Oh, you still use the same tools? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a carjacker or something could do this? <laughs> yes, but um, modern cars use electronics. It's actually going to only bind up one of the driver pins. Only one of the driver pins is getting in the way. Yeah. I want. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want an electric car. Nowadays, car keys 
have electronics in them. Uh, there's a new Aston Martin <laughs> car. Anyway, he's going to get on car talks. What we're talking about lots. So old, vintage cars, more easy to use this. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Now, I might put it a little lower in the lock myself, just to get it out of, out of your way. I would do that myself. That here? That's what I think is pretty good. So, gentle turning pressure. Oh, there we go. I got it again. Mm -hmm. Pick a direction. So, which way you want to go? Okay, that way? Okay. And then see, if you're going to turn that way, can I make one adjustment? I might spin this around this way. So, with this hand is fine, just gentle turning pressure. And then try to get under that pin and get it moving. If I might want to make one more adjustment. Hold on. See how the sharpie bump there? Yeah, I would spin it around that way. And if you can get under the pin, you got it. You got it. Okay, I'm good. Not bad. Another one? A number two, maybe? That's a number one. We'll get a number two over here. Better than I. What do we get? It's already done. We'll have level three. We, I am so thrilled by that. Yeah. We have a four. I'm going to go get her. We're well. having trouble with just long number two. That's all right. This takes a long this, time to get good at. This man over here freaking knocked his pick out of his Guys, thing. I'm still on like level two, and I've been doing this for months. So, all right. All right. So, that's why I'm trying to get it to yeah. slide in. I got this pressure like this on here. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't have, uh, I don't have, there you go, you're getting it. I can do this. No, this one's easy. So yeah, that'll give you just a little more room into the keyway. And which number lock are you on, two? Two. I mean, I have the full set. Mm-hmm, I see that. There you go. Nice. Kind of a pickle. You got it? Open? Nice. Excellent. There's a number three. I already did this two. You do those two? Do you want to try number three? Yeah. I am freaking out right now. Like, we're on threes and fours. This is wild. She's done the four. You kidding me? No. She's, she's done all we have. Yeah. You are doing... <laughs> if you got a four, you are doing real locks at that point. Four is like a lock in the absolute real world. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. super like yeah. Yeah. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> And by, by eventually, are you able to determine where, like, are you feeling each pin? Like you can kind of feel that what's going on in there? Okay. That's the, the coolest part. Once you start doing it with a little bit of intentionality and you say, I understand that I'm touching this, now I'm touching this, you're not just throwing a bunch of randomness at the lock. You're really interacting with the lock in a meaningful way. I'm on the three now. You can try a three. We're getting threes coming around. Mm -hmm. One is really easy. Yeah. Number one is just like straight up and turn. Right. Yeah. And then two. Two is just kind of like, like. To get one and then the other. One and then the other. And then the three, it's, there's so many of yeah. them in there. Why? I can't. I can't. It's just not easy. It's mm -hmm. really hard. Yeah. So, yeah, you remember you're feeling the pins, you're feeling them move. I feel one, two of them. And then I feel like it's another one. Yeah, and you'll feel it kind of every time a pin Yay. breaks. Yeah. Another open? We got a three? Yeah. Another three. Let's go. Hell yeah. Got it. Okay. Wow. Nice. Well, that go, that's really a lot. Oh, it just it was just rotating all the way around. Yeah, yeah, because you, lock, you locked it again. Is there five? Did you get it? Yes, I did. Nice. Okay. Uh, can I get a number five? Uh, we don't have a five. You already got the four. Yeah. You know where number fives are? Yeah. Out at a hardware store. Oh, all right. You've done everything we brought today. That's a nice job, man. Right on, Pedro. Thank you. You were involved in a larger educational group that goes between institutions, I believe? Yes, I work at um, Education Service Center Region 13, mm -hmm. um, which serves quite a large area. Mm -hmm. And um, we support all of those districts. And we, uh, one of the things that we do is provide um, extra events like STEM events or mm -hmm. um, ECC events, um, different things to support the districts that maybe the districts aren't able to provide and also some of the smaller districts where maybe they don't have 
peers mm -hmm. um, that are also blind or low vision, they can come and gather around with their peers and then have these specialized events. Cool, cool. Um, so that's what we were hoping. Had you done any sort of lock picking events Never. before? Never. <laughs> that's why we were so excited. This was amazing. The fact that they would wait for each step even, because everyone was excited about the next part, and I was worried it was just going to be a go bazoo, but like everyone was like, I want to know how this works, I want to know how this works. And there was so much engagement, I noticed. Oh, I, that, is, that was impressive. It's um, rare we find activities that keeps, this is quite a diverse, uh, as far yes. as skill level here today. And so it's very fun that everybody is fully engaged the whole time. I mean, nobody even left to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Which is I like, didn't notice that. Yeah. Well, we did. Yeah. <laughs> there was so much engagement, yeah. and you could see everybody using those critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and working on their problem solving, and you could see the excitement. Sweet. Yeah. So fun. This was your first time doing anything like this before, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? Like I don't know, it, 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 it was pretty cool, pretty fun. Yeah. yeah Something like, different. Yeah. The entire concept of like learning how a lock would be built piece by piece and just learn how to unlock it seems pretty yeah. interesting. So was it clear what the parts were as we were handling them? Did they start to help develop a model that you could understand when we did it step by step building the lock? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Cool. And then when you got to try the real metal locks, you knew like what the parts were more or less, and why why the pins were moving and why the tools were doing what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And what numbers did you get up to? I'm still at four. <laughs> four is the best one we got yeah. here today, though. Yeah. Oh, for real? Yeah. Oh, well, cool. Once you get a four, I, I, I that's a real the best world. one then. If you buy a lock in a store, it's probably uh, going to be four pin or five pin, uh, maybe six. But that's that's real locks at that point, man. That's no joke. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I had I already finalized uh, number four. Nice. Yeah. Nice job. I think it's pretty cool because, like, you know, you don't really hear too much about this stuff mm -hmm. around that much. So, yeah, it was cool to try out and it was really dope. I well, liked it. Yeah, I like it. Why, I like yeah. it a lot. So, you need to come back. Yeah, that was yeah. great. When you were at DEF CON, did you think about the idea of bringing this material to to like a school like this, or would you have expected this to go over so well? You would have learned this anyway, I think. I mean, yeah, I would have, well, yeah, I, I want to learn this anyway, but um, I, I, I always wanted to teach or have blind people learn about lock picking anyway, and so to have a, like a, a, a class set up like this, where you can like break apart a lock and then actually have locks, um, considering I think the first time I went to DEF CON was exactly how I learned, I think, uh, school. Scorch? Scorch. Scorch and Char, yeah. Yep, basically you handed me exactly what you handed around. So I think it went over really really well, because how many other times you're going to actually break apart a lock, short of actually breaking apart a lock? Mm -hmm. When I sent out the activity proposal to teachers, I had like three teachers be like, that's amazing, like we've never had anyone here teaching lock picking. Like and all like that we have some teachers here who've been here for like 30 years and they're like in all 30 years, no one's taught the students how to like, you know, break locks and what how locks work, which I find really interesting because it's like it's a, not an inherently sighted skill. Yeah, it's a non-visual like very mm -hmm. tactile skill. I mean, I think I heard Scorch say like 50 times like stop staring at the lock. Not to me, obviously, but yeah. you know. But teaching about it is. It's that's why I love this concept. Is lock picking isn't something you do by looking, but learning about locks and all of our materials that any of us have ever had in the classrooms have always been very diagram based right? yeah. and very visual based. So actually going like step by step from baggie to baggie, that, that really was very did. nice. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have some structure right. to try to like pace it in a, in a sort of, we might say orderly way. Yeah. I mean, the kids were really into it. So like there were some Johnny jump aheads, but that's going to always happen. But it was, I, I like that I could tell we're all talking about the same thing at the same time. So one thing that I didn't hear that uh, helped me way back when, mm -hmm. uh, when I got into the security bracket, was like half pound of pressure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The degree of pressure. Communicating the subtlety involved. That if we had more time, I had, oh, yeah. ideally we would have tried to get into the finesse. And some of the other adults were helping the kids, being like, whoa, that's way too much. Ease yeah. off. Yeah. But for a, a beginning intro, like purely intro, intro, nice. Very nice. Looking at the day, the, the thing that I want to focus on is our students had some experience in lock picking. 
coming here thinking about how to teach lock picking based on Kenny's model, and we've been thinking about the pedagogy of how to teach it as we've been learning. And one thing that I found out is the best teachers are the ones who just learned. People who've been teaching it a while start to forget details, right? And so if you just learned something, get that person to teach somebody else. So over here, what we saw um, was, I don't know, almost a, a parallel, right? Our, our students were, how would you teach somebody who's unsighted? Mm -hmm. You solved the problem. I didn't show them your solution. They came over and had started a parallel solution. And now we're gonna go back and think further about mm -hmm. the pedagogy and open source everything. What I saw here today was freaking beautiful. It was the community at the tables, the students sat down and even though some students had a little bit of experience and some students were just starting out, when you're doing this, like, I don't know, like the social, like, like a sewing circle, right? Like you're doing a thing yeah. and we're all really comfortable. Mm -hmm. we're, we're each having different micro tactile experiences mm -hmm. based on neurodiversity or, or not being sighted, but the communication just, there's something around lock picking that just brings out joy, laughter and community. Well, I, I'm really thrilled. Thank you for inviting me down, and thank, thank you for, for arranging here. all this. Um, thank yeah. you for making this whole thank thing. Thank you for the pizza and beer. Absolutely. So I am the only person at this table who's not been to DEF CON. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love you. This was really fun for me. I Today, I got up to a two-pin lock. Hadn't okay. done that before. And for me, it's a really useful skill. I frequently lock myself in my garage or otherwise out of my home. Okay. And so when Sue told me, oh, do you want to do lock picking? I thought, yes, please. The kind of having to, to do the mind shift of, I'm so used to relying on my vision. I'm so used to relying on my vision. And then I get here and that's not gonna cut it. Mm -hmm. I'm learning from people who are used to not using their vision. Mm -hmm. Slow down, try this, try that. And so I'm getting all this extra education there too, and this is just a lot of fun. Cool. And Sue says I need to come to DEF CON. Yeah. Mark says too, everyone's been telling We're, me. You need to come to DEF CON. You, you need to DEF CON. Okay, nice. just <laughs> stick me in the trunk of the car. Don't do that, actually. Or, actually, what? if I get good enough at this, <laughs> sure, stick me in go. the car. Then we'll be just, yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll see you out there.